Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, good afternoon. And to our viewers outside of Singapore, uh, it could be good morning or good evening, whichever is appropriate. Welcome to the annual ST Lee Distinguished Lecture. I am delighted to welcome and to introduce our guest speaker who will give us the lecture, Dr. Parag Khanna, who is the founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario based strategic advisory firm. Dr. Khanna is a very distinguished um, individual and a very prolific author. His recent publication, Move the Forces Uprooting Us, um, comes with other publications. In fact, uh, just last year, he also produced the book, The Future is Asian, Commerce, Culture, sorry, Commerce, Conflict and Culture in the 21st Century. He is also an author of a trilogy of books on the future of the world, beginning with the first book, the second world empires and influence in a new global order. And this was followed by another one, how to run the world, charting a course to the next Renaissance. And the third of the trilogy is uh, entitled Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global global civilization. Dr. Parag was also named by Esquire's magazine as one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century. So without further ado, may I now invite Dr. Parag Kana to give his lecture. Over to you, please. Thank you so much, Meli. I really appreciate your generous introduction. I'm very grateful to RSIS and NTU for inviting me to give this, uh, this lecture this year. Um, it's been about one year since my last lecture for the NTU community, and I don't know if any of us thought one year ago that we would be back again uh, for another round of remote uh, conversations, but we'll certainly make the most of it. I do believe that uh, we've all been very fortunate to be here in Singapore, uh, you know, where uh, we have weathered this COVID storm through a good dose of uh, good governance and solidarity and uh, effective uh, response uh, across, the, uh, across the nation, across the communities. And I'm very grateful for that. So even though we are not meeting in person, we're certainly at least uh, safe and secure and can be grateful for that. And um, it is, of course, a very ironic moment to be talking about the future global mobility of the world population. Because, of course, after all, this COVID lockdown, especially last year, was the most singularly coordinated act in human history. Right? Never before can we, uh, can we uh, cite a situation where all governments and societies across the world simultaneously, whether through coordination or simply through copycat effects, agreed and executed lockdowns of this scale, closing borders, shutting down mobility. It happened nearly simultaneously. It didn't happen perfectly. Many countries are still struggling to enforce lockdowns if and when and where they are necessary. But to even have attempt, attempted something on such a singular global scale affecting every single human life in the world was something really remarkable. And so it is, of course, then given the fact that international migration and in many ways domestic movement and relocation basically fell to almost zero, certainly on a relative basis and an absolute basis. Why is it that now is the time or it makes it a very interesting time to make a prognosis about the future. And my uh, prediction is that after this great lockdown comes the next great migration. But the question is from where to where, who? What are the directions? Who are the people? And what are the drivers and the forces? And one of the interesting things about the years ahead, whether it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, will be that we will have much better measurement over who goes where, and even perhaps why they go. 
Because unlike previous eras of mass migrations, especially if we look at the 20th century after World War II, or obviously centuries prior, where people traveled about the world without passports, Today, we all have machine readable passports, vaccination certificates, and all kinds of other data that we carry with us wherever we go. So for better or worse, our movements are closely tracked and monitored and logged. And whereas in historically, even as recently as the late 20th century with political upheaval and movements of people across borders, even with the Arab Spring and its aftermath, we can only estimate within tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, how many people have gone here and there. In the future, we're going to know with a great deal more precision what number of people have moved from place X to place Y. And that's going to be extremely useful data points uh, looking ahead. What I've tried to do with this new book, Move, is to make some predictions, make some forecasts around what our future human geography is actually going to look like and how we got to where we will be in the year 2050. And that's the story of this book, Move, and it's what I'd like to give you just a few slides on uh, today to just kind of uh, give a pressy of the book that's going to be released in uh, October of this year. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and uh, go into present mode. Here we are. Okay, let me begin by emphasizing that actually, this is not merely a book about migration. Migration is an extraordinarily important subject. And from a political science point of view, what is remarkable about migration is of course the stickiness of sovereignty. This remains one area of true sovereign writ. There are so many aspects of political life, of governance over which countries now bow to international pressure, uh, coercion, compellence, rulemaking by international bodies, whether it is um, currencies and interest rates or even laws and regulations. But when it comes to migration, at the end of the day, each country still has total sovereign control over its borders. Even in the case of the European Union and the Schengen Zone, we saw that during the pandemic, as well as other recent instances, such as the aftermath of the financial crisis a decade ago, even countries that are bound by a law to remain very open to each other and fully open are willing and able to close their borders to the movement of people. So the truth is, this is the singular area where states can still impose true sovereignty. Um, and that, that, is, that is very remarkable. So, so restricting or enabling the movement of people around the world. So our human geography therefore is shaped very much uh, by that. So this is again, migration is a subset of the broader question of human geography, which is really the outcome that I am seeking to map. But it's not the only kind of geography. There are underlying layers of geography that shape our dispersal around the world. The first is of course, natural geography, our environmental features and conditions. That can be the climate, it can be the topography. Uh, you know, a map like this is representative of what we mean when we speak of natural geography. And here, there's not a whole lot of dispute or disagreement. We use the color brown for the deserts, green for the forests, blue for the oceans, correct? correct? However, of course, there's a lot of dynamism and volatility in this map because of climate change. We have rising sea levels, we have desertification, we have flooding, we have melting glaciers. So this map actually of natural geography is changing all the time and that affects where we live. And I'm gonna come back to this of course uh, in a bit more detail. The next layer of geography is of course our political geography. Again, the sovereign, uh, the map of sovereign nation states and their borders. And this is the map of course that most people have on their walls in their offices and classrooms. In many ways, we raise our children to grow up believing that a map like this is quite natural, even though it also contains quite a lot of dynamism and change. Uh, we have borders that, that, uh, that, are, um, that are labile. We have states that collapse or merge. 
disintegrate and so forth. So the map of political geography is also always changing. But as I mentioned, nation states have sovereign writ over the uh, control, the passage of people from one state to another. I've spent a great deal of my, you know, sort of literary uh, career and political science work devoted to thinking of the ways in which we transcend this map, in which there are more accurate ways of representing the actual nature of interactions within the context of globalization. And I've argued that we need to look more at a map like this, functional geography, infrastructure. We have spent the last hundred years in particular investing far more capital in building connectivity across borders uh, than we have borders between states. And those, of course, have a very significant impact on the relationship between societies. So this could be uh, railways or pipelines or internet cables, electricity grids, uh, and so forth. So all of that is the map of functional geography, our cities, our infrastructural linkages, and the supply chains and commercial relationships uh, that enable, of course, the movements of goods, of technology, of capital, uh, of labor, uh, ideas and so forth around the world. So this is the map of functional geography. And lastly, then we have our current human geography, the actual distribution of the 8 billion members of the human species. Where are we? Well, of course, we are largely an Asian species, right, in terms of geography. Most of the human population lives in Asia particularly in China, India, right here in Southeast Asia. Overall, Asia has about 4.6 out of the 8 billion people in the world. And of course, this is one of the only regions in the world where the overall population is still growing. So these four layers of geography, the natural, the political, the functional, and the human, these don't exist in a stable state, in an equilibrium. In fact, they are highly out of sync with each other. They are highly misaligned. We live in a world right now where we have overpopulated societies that are struggling with significant resource stress, but we have depopulated societies with a significant resource bounty, for example. We have aging countries with labor shortages and young countries with labor surpluses. And these misalignments and imbalances are a huge part of the inefficiency, if you will, in the world today. We live in a very suboptimal alignment of the layers of geography that shape human life. And I believe that what will happen, whether peacefully or violently, whether through foresight or by accident, either sustainably or unsustainably, is that the map of human geography is going to continue as it always has for 100,000 years ever since mankind wandered out of Africa, it is going to continue to evolve. What I'm seeking to do is to give that process a nudge through some analysis around what would constitute a more sensible human geography in light of the natural shift in natural conditions, the shift in political conditions, and the shift in functional conditions. So let's start, of course, with the natural conditions that are changing. Here, what you see is the most recent NASA forecast around what's called the suitability change for the world. Now, red does not mean that a geography is completely uninhabitable, though, of course, the Sahara Desert is. But it is simply a reflection that these geographies will become even less suitable for human life as climate change accelerates and particularly temperature rise accelerates. Whereas areas that are shaded in green uh, with the spectrum leading to darker shades of green are places that are going to be more suitable to habitation than they have been currently. And this is a process that will unfold as temperatures rise from 1.5 degrees Celsius over the 1990 IPCC baseline towards two degrees, two and a half degrees, three degrees and beyond. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some of the areas that are the most climate propitious that are the most suitable for human habitation have, in fact, the fewest people. You can see that Canada, which has a population that is one quarter of that of Russia, are the two largest countries in the entire world and are heavily depopulated, but are colored here on this map entirely in various shades of green. So this is just one example of the mismatch. 
Will we see a correction in the years and the decades ahead, a realignment of geographies towards a different kind of equilibrium where populations move away from uninhabitable zones towards those that are more propitious? Well, that depends. It will depend on other layers of geography. It will depend on what happens to political geography. It will depend on what happens to the politics and the, and the outlook and the vision uh, of countries and governments. It will depend on functional geography. Where do we build the infrastructure that will allow for humans to sustainably inhabit and reside? Or it could be, and this is one of the, the arguments in the book, that many people, if not hundred, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, may in fact become more nomadic, perpetually mobile. We will be unable to know in it sufficiently in advance or to stabilize habitats such that we can consider them permanently habitable. And we might also suffer from various tragedy of the commons kinds of effects, where if many people move to a pristine geography, of course, they may ruin it and people may flee from it for a variety of reasons. So there could be gentrification and flight at the same time. So geopolitical climate gentrification is a term that we are now speaking about in, uh, you know, in the literature and in uh, scenarios around what the future may hold. Overall, I see uh, you know, five or more driving forces behind the coming expansion numerically of global mobility and the mass migrations that lie ahead. One is, again, the demographic imbalances, the gap between old and young within countries and across them. Political upheavals. Of course, whenever there has been uh, cases of civil wars or international conflict, you have refugee flows from the Balkans, uh, from Syria, from Afghanistan, of course. Economic dislocation, when there are uh, financial crises, people move. Uh, in the United States after 2008, that meant moving from the Rust Belt states of the north towards the sunnier states of the south and the west. In Europe, that meant people moving from uh, southern Europe towards northern Europe. And of course, in China, when factories close in the Greater Bay Area, people move north and look for other cities where there might be work and construction or other sectors. So we are all in many ways, economic uh, migrants. Technological disruption, which can mean labor automation. When a factory is automated, people have to leave that factory town. Or remote work and digitization means that people can become digital nomads and go and live in Estonia or Costa Rica or Bali and still maintain their jobs. And then, of course, there's climate change. And for 100,000 years, climate has been a critical factor in determining our, uh, you know, our, our human geography. And what climate models tell us is that the optimal latitudes for human habitation, which goes by the term climate niche, is shifting. And as human beings, we must shift with that niche. That niche will not shift to us. And if you multiply these drivers by the reality of increasing international global connectivity, whether it is physical or digital, what you have is a potential for accelerated mobility of individuals uh, in the world. Now, where is this taking us? We cannot be certain. When I set out to undertake this project a few years ago, I thought this might be a straightforward case of people moving from south to north. But if you've been watching television recently, you've seen that uh, Si Russian Siberia is ablaze, and that the smoke from those forest fires has reached the North Pole. You've seen that Canada, you know, and pristine areas around Vancouver are also ablaze. And we have forest fires even in Greenland, which of course on our maps is colored white. So that might come as a surprise to many people. So are there really pristine, stable geographies? Or again, will we have to be nomadic or be more flexible. Because we don't know the future, uh, we use scenarios. And the narrative of my book is structured around uh, you know, looking at how these scenarios will play out in different parts of the world. Not one common statement for the whole world, because the truth is that as you know, maps of geography, uh, as, geographic, as geography shows us, we live in a world of regions very much, geographical regions, geological regions. 
So one scenario, and the axes here are scenarios that, that correlate to lower or higher degrees of migration along less or more sustainable pathways. So there's a regional fortresses scenario where walls and borders go up, regions that are sustainable, uh, you know, wall themselves off, if you will, and become more fortress-like. There's a scenario where that also occurs, but those stable climatic zones, such as North America or Europe, aren't necessarily politically stable. There's something of a new Middle Ages phenomenon because they too face climate risks. There's a barbarians at the gate scenario, which is a mix of the neo-medievalism with mass migrations, uh, further upsetting what little stability there is in climatically uh, stable zones. And then the only positive scenario is what I call Northern Lights, in which there is, generally speaking, a south to north shift, but it's done in a, a sustainable uh, fashion as possible, while continuing to enable mobility of people to react to changing environmental or, um, uh, or political conditions. So these are the four scenarios. And the way scenario planning works is that it should always be done in such a way that there is a degree of overlap between the scenarios, because in truth, the future will be all of the above. It will be elements of all of these four scenarios in every continent of the world. The question is, to which degree in which place? So as I mentioned, if you take, uh, if we look at a couple of uh, sort of sample regions, this is North America. The climate niche had earlier put agriculture very strong in the southern belt of the United States. But now you see that it's migrating northward towards the Great Lakes region on the Canadian border. What's interesting, and the most recent United States census reveals this, the population of the Great Lakes region continues to decline. We continue to see an outflow of people from the most propitious climate areas. Whereas the population is growing the fastest in states like Texas and Florida, which are becoming decreasingly livable from a climate standpoint. Why? Because of course, climate variables are not properly priced in to real estate or other uh, considerations. Instead, people follow sunshine or low taxes. But in the future, we can imagine that based upon the existing climate models that we have, in which of course the worst case scenario is becoming more and more likely, um, it's, it's likely that we will see a reversal in these demographic flows uh, and people will move back towards this elevated area that is green. And that's part of the reason why I always advocate thinking in, at a continental scale, not purely in terms of political geography alone. Because the truth is that 90% of the Canadian population lives within several kilometers uh, of the US border, very, very close. And um, the Great Lakes region or Hudson Bay or you know, other parts of depopulated parts of Canada are becoming more and more livable while more and more of the United States is becoming unlivable. So the truth is that the combined population uh, of North America, including of course, Mexico and Central America, where there has been for years now a refugee crisis uh, owing to the droughts and, and, and uh, natural disasters in Central America and the political unrest there as well that is pushing people further and further north. A number of studies have been done around the likelihood of, uh, a re of estimates of the number of climate migrants who could push from uh, South Central America and South America into North America. And that number is anywhere from 20 to 40 million people, for example. So if you take even the organic rate of population growth and legal migration, as well as climate refugees, you have a, a, a growing population in North America that would easily touch 450 or 500 million people in the coming 20 or 30 years. Their geographic distribution is not necessarily going to hew to historical patterns of concentrating on the coastal areas where of course sea levels are rising or the southern US states where of course temperatures are rising or simply staying on one versus the other side of the border. During the pandemic, in fact, there was a record numbers of property searches by Americans for Canadian real estate uh, to take one example. Now what's also interesting about North America and it's something that few people know 
uh, in light of the recent rhetoric of the Trump administration that focused so much on building a wall, is that in fact, the two main borders of North America are actually the most uh, intensely uh, traversed borders on the planet Earth by a very, very, very large margin. And so people think of North America really as being you know, three discrete states, albeit ones that are at peace with each other. But in the future, when you factor in the supply chain integration, the climate conditions, the demographic and labor shortages across these markets and so forth, you could imagine a much more fluid a continental scale geology with a not a supranational European Union style uh, set of institutions grafted on top, but something resembling a more federated North American Union, as I have uh, described uh, in, in various uh, projects. Uh, another trigger for thinking about the future of human geography is, in fact, our own demographics as a species. Now, COVID, as you may have been following in the news over the last couple of years, has triggered a very, very steep decline in fertility uh, in just this last year and a half, this measurable time frame. One estimate from the United States suggests that um, uh, I believe more than 200,000 fewer babies were born than would have been born based upon the 2019 trajectory, for example. Now, it's actually the second baby bust in uh, just recent memory, because after the financial crisis, the same thing happened again. At that point, it was economic insecurity. And of course, with COVID, it was economic and epidemiological at the same time. But two successive baby busts on a global basis, one after the other in a short period of time, is simultaneous or, or combined in combination amount to a fertility catastrophe for the human species. We need to be very, very clear about this. These are not normal events and it is not normal for them to happen even just once, let alone twice back to back. And they build on top of the fact that global fertility has actually been declining for decades. And so, whereas in the 1990s, we actually spoke about the idea of a Malthusian crisis of an overpopulated world whose total population could reach 15 billion people. Instead, we are actually entering a phase that I call peak humanity. That's one of the terms that I, that I coined in the process of researching this book, because the, the fact is that by 2035 or 2040, we will actually reach the maximum number of human beings that will ever be alive simultaneously. So that number is coming a lot sooner than we thought, and the number is a lot smaller than we thought that it would be. The world population may in fact never reach 9 billion people. And the, de the demographers who have been looking at this, you know, going back decades and making prognostications have been off by billions of people in their forecasts in just my own recent memory. So I don't think that we should be listening all too carefully to those who still continue to forecast as the University of Washington recently did, a population that will peak at 10 or 11 billion people. My best guess is less than 9 billion people. Now, this is interesting. You have declining fertility everywhere in the world, even in poor countries. In the wealthy world, it already feels relatively empty in the sense that we've had uh, you know, sub-replacement fertility and zero population growth absent immigration for quite a long time. So the question I ask myself is, what happens when we, when we come to realize that we have this finite rather than constantly replacing and expanding world population? and you have aging populations in the North in need of a young labor force. Will that mean that there will be a transition, either sudden or gradual, from today's populism and xenophobia towards a competition to recruit young migrants who are the taxpayers and the caregivers and the infrastructure builders and the homeowners and so forth uh, of the world? And that remains a major uh, outstanding question. Let me go back, by the way, to this issue about um, why I'm focusing on what I call the war for young talent, not just the war for talent. And again, it goes back to the baby bust. Fertility has been declining for a long time, and the millennial, you know, Generation X is having fewer children than the baby boomers had. And today's Generation Z, who are today's, uh, you know, uh, 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 
preteens and tweens, um, are the largest generation that mankind as a species has ever produced, right? Just about um, you know, 2 billion or so uh, generation Z. Generation alpha, or 1.8 billion. Generation alpha, which is today's uh, toddlers and babies and still unborn until the year 2025, according to the definition, the demographic definition of these generations. Had we not had the financial crisis and not had COVID, it was predicted that Generation Alpha would top out at roughly 2 billion people. So Generation Alpha would have been larger than Generation C. And that's, of course, what we would expect after a century of breakneck population growth, where the world population in 1928 was 2 billion people and reached 8 billion people or more by 2018 in a 90 year period. Every generation, of course, has been substantially larger than the one before. Suddenly, that's no longer the case. If you see the dashed line on the right side of the chart, that is the, that is the result of the financial crisis and uh, uh, COVID. So you will have a generation alpha that will likely be smaller than generation Z. And that tells us something very interesting that can really only be described in science fiction terms as to what is happening to our human population. The present is becoming the future. What does that mean? Well, again, historically, every generation is followed by one larger than itself. So today's youth get older and they're replaced by a larger generation behind them. But if today's youth are not having children, then they are not replaced by a larger generation, right? They are the largest generation. So the present remains the present even in the future. The present is the future and there's fewer people left. And that remains, that, that is likely to be the case. So when we talk about the war for talent, we're talking about most of all, which countries will attract the young people of today because they are the last young people, the last large cohort of young people. So I focus my research in this book on the world population that is under the age of 40, which is of course the majority of the world population and represents 100% of the future because they will be the ones that are alive in 2030, 2040, and 2050. You can see of course that baby boomer mortality accelerates uh, on a downward slope starting in the 2020s and into the 2030s, as you would naturally expect even with greater life expectancy. So, when we talk about uh, this, you know, uh, the, the youth of the world, this Generation Y and Generation Z and Generation Alpha is the large, uh, you know, sort of great generations uh, of the world. Um, and them being the last, it means that you will have this zero sum war for global talent because my immigration gain is your immigration loss. And it's not the case that every country simply has a ever larger population coming behind it in its own country, not even in India or Indonesia or elsewhere where fertility is declining. Instead, it becomes zero sum. So the war for talent becomes more important than ever before. And the war for talent takes on a whole new meaning because the war for talent used to mean simply the competition for top tier management professionals in the financial industry in the transatlantic domain. So a very limited, narrow understanding of the concept. In the 2010s, it expanded somewhat because emerging markets became more prominent, expat positions you know, in geographies became uh, more desirable, and the range of sectors, especially technology, became part of the game in the war for talent. So you had finance and technology, and you had the US and Europe and Japan, and then China sort of emerging. The 2020s is going to be a whole new chapter and the next decades in general will be a whole new chapter in the global war for talent because we have competition amongst all geographies, those that are livable, to attract young people who are skilled or unskilled to meet their labor shortages and to drive innovation and investment uh, in their societies. And it's many different sectors that are competing with each other. And it's competition within companies even because people who are talented and want to work remotely may choose geography simply on the basis of tax arbitrage or other conveniences. So this is a whole new chapter in the global war for young talent. Now, let's go back to the ge geography of origin of young people in the world today that constitute that pool of young people who will shape and determine 
our future human geography. And part of it is simply looking back at the demographic map of today's human geography, which centers on Asia. Because of course, Asians, again, are not only the majority of the human population, they're also the majority of young people in the world. Now within Asia, of course, um, we know that the Indian population is actually now larger than the Chinese population. Part of this is very new news because the most recent Chinese census, if I'm not mistaken, uh, had um, corrected for an overestimation of the Chinese population that was off by about 120 million people, if I'm not mistaken. So larger than the population of most countries in the world was the error in the Chinese uh, population uh, statistics in between the two most recent census uh, figure uh, sort of collections. That's really quite profound. What's more, of course, India has a much younger median age than China does. So even though Chinese and Indians, of course, do combine, or even individually are still the two largest countries in the world demographically, um, the young South Asian, more broadly, not just Indian, but the young South Asian population is likely to be to represent a larger diaspora than the Chinese population does today. As you may know, today the Chinese diaspora is about twice as large as the Indian diaspora. I predict that, and I explain in more detail in the book, that, I, that one can imagine the overall South Asian diaspora being twice as large as the Chinese diaspora in the coming decades. This also cannot, this, this analysis also cannot be separated from looking at geopolitics and the tensions with China and the fact that Chinese are more willing to return to China um, uh, where the, where, you know, sort of uh, the economy is growing, there's political stability and so forth. Whereas, of course, with India, there is a pretty significant outward push given the poverty levels, given the environmental and political conditions and so forth. And of course, where people are welcome versus where they're not welcome. In Western uh, societies right now, where suspicions of China are very high, you have uh, re-regulation of uh, economic um, or an uh, sort of educational systems such that it becomes difficult for Chinese to study technical subjects in the United States. Um, whereas South Asian populations, particularly Indians that speak English, that study IT or math or engineering, and that are politically not considered suspicious are more welcome. And therefore you see that the rate of growth in the South Asian populations in Canada, in the United States and in Europe is growing faster than uh, the rate of Chinese populations. Already today in the OECD countries, there is 1 million more Indian professionals than there are Chinese professionals. And that gap is probably going to widen considerably. Now, let's start to look at the global human geography picture. Prior to COVID, we had settled into relatively stable patterns of intra and inter-regional migration. The largest stock of cross-border migrants, settled migrants in the world is actually people who have relocated across the borders of uh, the states of the former, the republics of the former Soviet Union, um, followed by the migration of South Asians into the Gulf countries, uh, movement of people from, uh, I should mention also from Latin America into North America, uh, those populations within Africa, within Europe, within ASEAN and so forth. What can we surmise about the future? And this is where I make a number of you know, fairly sweeping uh, projections uh, because we will see certain patterns shift. I'll identify just uh, one or two of the major uh, dyads because if you layer all of these maps together, especially the climate map with this map, um, and, and, the, and the sort of uh, heat map around, um, uh, around old and young, one of the new vectors or expanding vectors is going to follow from what I just mentioned around the talent shortages uh, and the war for talent uh, in aging countries, especially in Europe. So I can imagine a, many more Asians migrating to Europe in the decades ahead. So let me give you a bit of context. Uh, I grew up as an Asian American in New York, an immigrant, an immigrant to the United States, uh, you know, born in India. And uh, there are today 25 million Asian Americans. By contrast, in the European Union, and again, I'm excluding England, which is no longer in the EU and has a, a large stock, of course, of South Asians owing to post-colonial migrations. In the European Union, there's only 4 million 
Asians. So there's only one fifth, one sixth as many Asians in Europe right now versus the number in the United States. So five or six times more Asians have crossed the Pacific Ocean or moved via the Gulf countries as my family did in the 1970s and 1980s to the United States than have moved to Europe, which they share, of course, the Eurasian landmass with. But if you overlay trade patterns and infrastructure investment, again, the functional geography, you will see something that many of you already know that uh, Europe's largest, Europe trades much more with Asia than it does with the United States, right? Nearly 30 to 40% more. The Belt and Road Initiative and other commercial corridors and new silk roads and so forth are getting underway and being installed and built to further link uh, Europe and Asia in terms of trade. We do see, in fact, a far larger number of your Asian students choosing to go to Europe instead of North America because tuition is subsidized, the medium of instruction is changing to English. These countries are uh, issuing blue cards as they're known uh, to Asian entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. So I can imagine, and, and Europeans are developing a preference when it comes to migrants uh, to bring in Asians who assimilate better, who focus on learning the language, who are obedient to local laws uh, over uh, Arabs and Africans. Now, this is very politically sensitive stuff that I'm saying, but it actually verbatim res uh, reflects conversations I've had with European policymakers on this issue, which has not made the news yet. But some of these arguments and others underpin my, my forecast that we will see a substantial growth in the number of what I call Asian Europeans. And that's another coinage from the book. There is no equivalent term, uh, at least in the vernacular, for Asian Americans in Europe because they're too few. But in the future, we will speak of Asian Europeans. And that number, as I said, could equal or exceed the number of Asian Americans. I'll move ahead a little bit into um, a final couple of points around where, where we are headed from an integrated standpoint around the centers of human geography, which is to say the population centers of the future versus where they are today. Now, there are a number of cities that you know, are very well known as large population uh, centers, you know, whether it's London, New York, Los Angeles in the West, or whether it is of course Chinese, uh, uh, Indian, and, uh, and other cities in, in the East, places like Tokyo, the Greater Bay Area, and so forth. But if you overlay the map of climate suitability, what you find is that there are certain swaths of geography that are very, you know, relatively low population density today, but a high capacity to absorb greater populations in the future. And what I've done in the book is I go sort of, you know, subregion by subregion and, and zone by zone and profile some of these geographies. What is it that makes them climate suitable? What are their natural resource endowments? Um, you know, what is their political uh, sort of, you know, quotient or, or circumstances today? And what does all of that tell us about uh, the, the potential for them to absorb more populations? Fundamentally, the question of, you know, human geography, again, is the distribution of the eight or nine billion of us around the world. And you could actually take uh, you know, eight billion people and they could all stand side by side, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on the island of Manhattan, right? Eight billion people can stand on the island of Manhattan. But what we have on our planet, this planet Earth, is we have 150 million square kilometers of terrain. So the fundamental question of human geography right, is what is the evolution of our geographic distribution? Because it actually isn't fixed. We have for 100,000 years actually been a nomadic species. For the last 100,000 years minus a large part of the last 5,000 years only, we have been nomadic. This map in the center actually shows you um, the, um, the rough outline of human migration out of Africa over the last 100,000 years. These pink threads, if you will, showing how mankind moved out of Africa up into Europe, eastward through Asia, down into Southeast Asia, up through China and Russian Siberia over the land bridge of the Bering Strait, down into North America and eventually South America. And this is also the journey. This is the exact route 
of the man who you see in this photograph on the right, standing on the right. His name is Paul Salopek. He's a National Geographic Fellow, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. And about seven years ago, he set out from the Rift Valley of Africa to walk this exact route, to make it all the way to the tip of South America from point A to point B. And it's roughly a 20 year journey. He's seven years into it and he's presently in China. And I walked with him uh, on one occasion and I plan to join him uh, several more times over the coming decade as he makes his way along this journey. And he documents it very uh, vividly in National Geographic magazine stories and websites and even a book that he's writing. And I'm mentioning this here because I'm supporting this uh, mission. Uh, this new book of mine, Move, is uh, I'm donating proceeds from the pre-sales of the book to support his cause and the entire nonprofit endeavor that is supporting this educational mission to uh, tell the story of our species, of our history, our anthropology and our migrations, because it tells the story of how we have been nomadic and how we might have to get used to becoming nomadic again, given the mismatch in our layers of geography, given the drivers of migration from politics to economics to technology to climate. And the truth is that we do not have a collective global or political game plan for actively or proactively managing our human geography. Because as I mentioned before, a political geography and sovereignty are of course the Trump factor. And we don't even have a proposal on the table in any multilateral body for a global accord around large scale population resettlement. We do have various very worthy initiatives around allowing uh, labor migration right, across countries. And we have very valid efforts that I've documented that seek to use technology like the blockchain and other kinds of uh, transparent tools to uh, reduce the friction in the cross-border movement of people. All of these are valid efforts and, all, and they will apply to hundreds of thousands of people and to millions of people, but not yet to tens of millions of people not yet to hundreds of millions of people, and certainly not to billions of people. But the question of human geography is a question about billions of people. It is precisely a question about eight to nine billion people. And so I've chosen to concern myself with that very large number and to think about what is driving us to move the past, present, and future, and what, if any, optimal map of the future we can pre-design and hopefully peacefully and sustainably get us to that point. So that in a brief nutshell is the book. And I very much appreciate your time and look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Parag, for that, um, I would just say comprehensive, but rather breathtaking presentation. There's really a lot there that you have uh, discussed with us. And, um, just on the notion of human geography and mobility, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that our audience would like to flag. I would like to invite uh, our audience to uh, start typing in the questions in the chat box so that we can uh, organize them and we can raise this with, raise your questions with Dr. Parag. Um, <clears throat> you know, the issue of human mobility is always, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always very controversial uh, and especially in light of the so-called drivers of mobility, you talked about climate being one of them, uh, some economic crises. Um, I was just wondering, just to kick us off while others are busy typing in their, their questions, uh, when, you, when you look at 2050 and you're looking at you know, directions of you know, where mobility, where do you see human mobility to be? Um, my first question is, with all the problems of the crisis of the Anthropocene, are you looking at an, an organized or disorganized mobility? Let just a quick response to that because now I see some questions coming. 
Sure. Farag? Yeah. Um, at the moment, it is more disorganized than organized. Within certain countries, you can see organized approaches. Within China, for example, there are efforts to resettle populations in areas where floodplains have dried up, for example, or where floods themselves are constantly too disruptive to remain in that geography. But in most countries, it is more scattered and haphazard. If you look at the United States, where people continue to resettle in coastal areas despite the constant risk of tropical storms and natural disasters and rising sea levels, there's now a disorganized approach towards trying to incentivize some of them to relocate. People are moving to areas that are totally desertified and where the freshwater supply will run out, and they may have to move en masse to other places. So by and large across the world, again, it is a very uncoordinated and disorderly process. And again, in the context of a world population in the Anthropocene that is uh, a peak humanity, we have to be very concerned that we are subjecting ourselves to a potential mass extinction event precisely because we do not have flexibility and resilience at a civilizational scale to respond to these kinds of uh, risks. And therefore I advocate for greater flexibility and, and fungibility across borders to respond to those threats. Okay, um, is this just to um, follow up on that trend about movements, particularly across border, we have two questions, um, which basically, uh, uh, you know, will, it, it talks about how does this issue, number one, the imbalance in capacity to, to migrate, uh, in this case, the question refers to the, the imbalance, meaning, you know, the differences in money, qualification, those who have more will have be, be, better able to, to move to livable places than those who don't. And the second really is when you talk about movements and particularly when you talk about war on talent, this, this thing is technological advancement. How do you factor that in? Which may not necessitate people migrating at all, despite having these changes in climate and the environment. So two things: the you know the ability, material ability to move or not to move. And the second is technological advancements. Please. Great, great question. So first, in terms of material ability, um, you know what I do early in the book is to make the case that out of the eight billion you know present population probably more than 4 billion will never leave the country in which they were born. They either do not want to move, are too old or frail or infirm to move, lack the, the wealth, the, the, the ability, uh, you know, the cash uh, or the connections, you know, the capacity to, to move and, and have access to another territory that is willing to absorb them, even if they had some material means. So 4 billion plus people could potentially be quote unquote ruled out. It doesn't mean that they are going to instantaneously perish in a mass extinction event, but it does mean that even if there is a dire change in circumstances, political or ecological in their country, they are still not going to be you know, welcome uh, to survive in another place. And that will be, of course, a tragedy. Uh, um, uh, so I'm now focused on the remaining four billion people, if you will, again, most of whom are young, who are spread around the world in, uh, in countries of the developing world, the South, if you will, emerging markets, and also the rich world, um, who can potentially relocate based upon their skills, the money they have, and so forth. So when we look at it that way, um, the question becomes, you know, what is the desire that those people have in different countries? And as you know, many surveys of youth in developing countries suggest that 50 to 75% or perhaps 100% of young people in sub-Saharan African countries would move if given the chance, right? So the question is, uh, will they? Will they be given the chance? Uh, where would they go? Which countries would absorb them? What would it cost? And that kind of thing. So this is uh, not in a question that we could generalize about other than the broad brushstroke numbers saying that we're talking about roughly 4 billion people who I think are candidates in the very near term, if you will, to move. It doesn't mean that one has to be rich, right? Uh, again, it can be skills-based migration, humanitarian migration. There are countries like Australia and New Zealand that are issuing climate visas. 
Um, you know, there are obviously again political considerations. The people of Hong Kong are being offered British citizenship and so forth. So again, as you and I have, uh, have established and agreed, there is no one size fits all, you know, coordinated policy here. Um, we are, when to answer this question, we actually have to look at, well, who are you? Where are you? Do you have skills? Do you have money? Do you have relatives in a certain country? And in a way, it is precisely that bottom up process that results in our current and future uh, map. Now, the technology question is very interesting, and technology is not simply uh, labor automation and artificial intelligence. And even if it is, it cuts both ways. If you lose your job, if you are actually a very well paid uh, financial professional in the city of Singapore or London or New York, and your job has been automated by an algorithm, and you are, uh, you do not have sufficient savings to still live in the wealthy you know, city that you live in and pay that rent or afford that mortgage, you will move even though you are rich. And that accounts for a significant number of people who relocated in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis from the city of New York. They lost their jobs, not because of technology, but because of an economic crisis, but the same thing is happening with technology and they cannot afford to physically live there, right? So the, the argument for redundancy uh, due to technology is not at the same time an argument for stasis, right? And for being sedentary, because you have to be able to afford to live where you are. So therefore, even a world of material comfort, uh, if we take the opposite scenario, a world of material comfort created by the combination of uh, AI and automation and universal basic income would technically also be a world where people would feel themselves to be more mobile if they were enjoying benefits anywhere where they are. So there is not a scenario where people just sit still because of technology. And again, the remote work movement is a very good example of this. What we've seen during the pandemic and subsequently is that whereas before the pandemic, there was about one or two countries that had nomad visa programs, such as Estonia, which is quite well known for this practice. Now 100 countries have nomad visas, right? About 100 countries have said, please come and live here if you're a digital nomad. If you can do your job from anywhere, please, we want you to live in our country and we will issue you an indefinite visa. This is because we need people to come and live here, to pay rent, to eat in our restaurants, to use our services, right? And such is the state of affairs. This is part of, this is one chapter or episode in the war for young talent, it's nomad visa. So technology cuts many different ways, but there's no scenario where we simply sit still because of technology other than technologies that are not related to AI and so forth. And that's air conditioning, right? Air conditioning is the technology that allows us to stay where we are, even if we are in um, a sweltering place. And of course, our country, Singapore is exhibit A, and the finest example in the world of the power of air conditioning to tame uh, the tropics, which is a sort of a you know rough characterization or summary of Lee Kuan Yew's uh, famous line about the phenomenon of air conditioning. So I have a chapter of the book called Air Conditioned Nations, which is of course a play on uh, words on a very a title of a famous book. And I look at the other very high temperature uh, equatorial or tropical latitude countries and whether or not their urban environments are, can make can sufficiently make the adaptation of air conditioning uh, in order to continue to maintain the population levels that they have, and even potentially be more attractive to people from similar latitudes who lack that technology of air conditioning. Now, of course, the irony of air conditioning being that it simply accelerates uh, global warming even further, but putting that aside, in a scramble for livability, people may favor places even if they're hot on a, the relative basis that they have air conditioning. So there's many, many, many different technologies at play is the bottom line. And each of them has an incentive effect, either a push or a pull effect on where people go if they can afford to or invited to or the skills to go somewhere. If, if I could push uh, you uh, further on that one, when you say, well, this, for as long as 
you know, you have, um, there, there'll be technology, there will always be people that are able to move, et cetera. But there's a question of demand because there's the understanding that with technology, the demands are actually different. In other words, it lowers demand for people to come in because, you know, you're, you're basically replace humans basically, or machines basically replace humans. And of course, the highest example of that is, is AI. But in between, we have a lot of redundancies that are taking place. And you have, and, and that's also the assumption that the young people that you're actually talking about that will comprise that percentage of people that are attractive for others to move have the right skills, right? Um, and most of, you know, if you look at the, the skill level of, of young people across the world, for example, it's very uneven. So how would that factor in, in, you know, in making sure that you actually have demand in light of the developments, rapid developments in technology, which makes us redundant? Yeah. This is a great question. So even if you are in a services economy where a great deal of the present stock of jobs is being automated, whether it is um, you know, working in warehouses or being a truck driver or being a, um, you know, working in the financial industry or technologies, even if a lot of that is automated. Now, you still have um, a circulation of people. You don't simply have, let's just take the example of Canada. In Canada, you have the same rate of labor automation as you have in other countries. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, modern industrial country investing in, in industry and robotics and so forth, but you don't have 25 million unemployed Canadians, right? Even though it's a services economy, it's as a large commodity sector, obviously, but, but GDP is, uh, is, is uh, you know, as a services, uh, very strong services component to it. But instead, what you see is a large degree of job creation in Canada in many sectors in housing, in healthcare, in education, in commodities, in infrastructure, because climate change is expanding the realm of possibility for what can transpire inside the Canadian economy. So Canada continues to be hungry for people to care for its elderly and to do all of these other things, even though we live in a world of labor automation. Now, we don't have robots caring for our parents. We don't have robots teaching our children in schools. We don't have robots collecting the trash. We don't have robots building and constructing our homes. There is some degree of technology in all of those non-tradable service areas, but technology has not taken over those non-tradable services areas. There are still services rendered by people. And very often the domestic skill set does not match the skill set that foreigners can provide. So if you look at Germany, where there is uh, you know, a, a fairly, I mean, not terribly high, but certainly higher than other countries rate of unemployment right now, you also have a high aging population. That doesn't mean that the young unemployed Germans automatically become elderly caregivers and nurses. In fact, Germany is absorbing any of the surplus uh, female nursing, uh, uh, stock that it can acquire from the Ukraine, from Bulgaria, from Romania, and as far as the Philippines, where if you, you know, you fly to Manila and you actually see posters where the German embassy has uh, taken out ads encouraging women to come and register to become nurses in Germany. Uh, you know, so they'll learn German in Manila before they get flown for their new career in, uh, in Germany. So the fact is that just because you have a stock of, you know, of either those made redundant or those where there's a skills mismatch, it doesn't mean that you'll automatically have that matching of skills. You will import people as needed. Um, again, Europe has a highly educated population, but it has a massive labor shortage in the technology sector because technology companies are growing and need to hire more people. So what do they do? They import Indians. And in the book, I report from you know, the, the headquarters of SAP. SAP is Europe's largest software company. And uh, the uh, campus of SAP has features, uh, I believe hundreds, if not thousands of Indians living outside of Frankfurt. Now, I assure you, they were not living there 10 years ago, right? They, are, they have arrived in the last 10 years even though Europe has plenty of educated young people and has a fairly high unemployment rate. So skills is a global issue and you can either import people with skills to work on site or you can export the work to those people. 
uh, depending on you know, different firms, different structures. So migration out of India is heavily restricted as a result of the COVID pandemic. But job creation in technology in India is skyrocketing because companies, multinational companies and banks have realized that if someone anywhere can do the job, then they will look for the lowest cost person anywhere. And they will fire people in the United States or Europe and hire them in India. And that's precisely what's happening right now. So we cannot, you know, in, in, we cannot accurately make a general statement, a deterministic statement about the fact that if technology makes people redundant, then why would you still import labor? Because you have to factor in the many different kinds of digitization and the many sectors where there's enormous skills gaps where the domestic labor force does not provide. Okay, uh, thank you. So, but th there's another question that's again re related to this. There seems to be a logic to why, in spite of technology, there will always be demand, as you have said. But how do you factor in the rising? Um, how how do you factor in issues like xenophobia? You know, and that's one. And for me, we are we have so far been talking about what I call more regular migration, labor migration. But there's also this, this phenomenon now of, of increasing um, forced migration coming from, you know, as a result of conflict, fragilities, including, of course, climate. And the numbers are also growing exponentially high. I mean, two years ago, we're looking at about 60 million or so just refugees, but now unforced migration, but now you're talking about close to 80 million, and that is going to increase. So you have on the one hand, a very chaotic type of movements, which is un which is forced migration, and that will affect, you know, the, the way they move into a particular country. And then there's the issue which is raised by our audience about xenophobia. So your thoughts on that, please. Yes, absolutely. So let's take the xenophobia question first in terms of the politics. And, you know, I, I dwell at this at, at great length uh, in the book in chapters on the United States and European countries. We have tended to allow those Western societies to shape our conversations about migration, even though they're not representative of the global norm, or rather where they do, in fact, despite the political rhetoric of xenophobic parties and actors, actually largely conform to the global norm of increasing absorption of migrants. If you take, for example, the most recent US census, even though the rate of annual intake of migrants uh, has been declining during the Trump administration, America has become more diverse and the Trump administration and the Biden administration now is making its best effort to pass immigration reform that would legalize or normalize the status of more than 10 million undocumented migrants in the country. And that would expand the H-1B visa quota uh, to allow more professionals uh, from around the world, particularly from India, to relocate uh, to the United States. And if you take the United Kingdom, another example where xenophobia, populism, nationalist politics, uh, you know, are considered to be the driving forces, identity politics behind Brexit. British immigration policy today, right now as we speak, is more open than before the Brexit referendum, which was an anti, to some degree, also an anti-immigrant movement. Let me give you a case in point. Uh, before Bre uh, Brexit, and, and even up until the last couple of years, if a uh, student from a uh, developing country wanted to live in the UK, wanted to move to the UK, they needed to pay a security deposit, right, a security bond, uh, and, you know, provide obviously their educational certifications and demonstrate that they had a valid job offer and produce that letter of their employer in the United Kingdom. As of literally last month, there's been a reform of that rule. Now, all you have to do is show your educational certification. And if you have graduated from a recognized institution, you are now allowed to relocate to the UK. That's it, full stop. No need for a security bond, no need for an offer of employment. That is a 180 degree shift in immigration, far more liberal than the United States, and in the very country that has come to represent for all of us, the xenophobic populism that is part of the question. The truth is that supply and demand is by far the most powerful law in the world. And supply and demand dictated like a ton of bricks 
to the British government that they are losing people, they're losing talent, they're losing money, they have labor shortages. The NHS has a shortage of doctors and nurses at the height of the COVID pandemic. It is utterly unconscionable how many British nationals died due to COVID simply because they didn't have appropriate number of medical staff. And this hit them very, very hard in the pocket, in the bottom line. And so they realize that in fact, we are engaged in a war for talent. We cannot continue to hemorrhage high net worth individuals and bankers and industry uh, because of Brexit. We have to actually do our level best to attract more people. And so today, as I said before, you have a more liberal immigration policy uh, uh, in, in, in England today than, than pre-Brexit. And every single country will come around to this same uh, status. The only question is whether they will uh, realize it sooner or later, whether it will be proactive or whether it will be kicking and screaming, right? And whether it is Italy, whether it is Germany, whether it is the United States, even Scandinavian countries, their demographic data is so uh, it, sort of worrying, right? Their, their aging populations, their outstanding pension obligations are so staggering that no amount of, remember, labor automation, if you automate jobs, you're, you're uh, of course, producing higher unemployment, potentially, and therefore requiring greater fiscal expenditure to support those populations, while not collecting greater tax revenue unless you're taxing robots, which at present no country is doing. You can imagine a political scenario where countries like uh, Japan or Germany that have a high degree of solidarity, competence, and foresight may tax capital even more than they already do to such an extent that they could maintain a low or declining population and use that tax revenue to provide a better quality of life. But again, you would still need those foreign nurses and you know truck drivers and bricklayers and all of those kinds of things that uh, aging societies lack. So the populism and nationalism is today what it always has been historically, merely a blip, literally a historically irrelevant blip. Precisely the population, populism and xenophobia and nationalism that has completely dominated Western headlines for the last half decade is nothing but a blip, uh, a mirage. And, and, and a, of course, a, what it is, is of course a great waste of time, right? A great uh, derailment, you know, and postponement of what ought to be and will eventually be by the law of supply and demand, a pragmatic immigration policy that allows supply to meet demand, because that is what history tells us always happens. There are just on that topic alone, I'm sure we could continue to, to debate that further when it comes to you know, the logic behind supply and demand and the political decisions that come with it. But there's another question here about, you know, with all these movements of people in, increasingly over the years, uh, the question is, what is your view on the future relevance of political borders and the constructs of nation state? Well, it's a very interesting question and a deep question, because quite frankly, as a political geographer myself, I, I don't actually buy the notion of a stable map of equal, you know, sort of sovereign, equal nation states um, in the international system. In other words, the Westphalian, you know, construct is very much a myth in the sense that it didn't really begin in a universal fashion in 1648, because of course we lived in a colonial and hierarchical and imperial world for the last several centuries since. And only with the collapse of the Soviet Union and full decolonization in uh, the you know, 1990s did we, could we actually even pretend to live in a world where the notion of sovereign equal nation states is an accurate representation um, you know, of, the, of, of, of the world. Um, so you know, I don't really, um, I think it's, it's a great distraction for people to believe that there is some archetypical uh, nation state. After all, in a way, the technical definition of nation state is ethnographically based and the number of such actual nation states in which the one ethnic group comprises 85 or 90 percent of the population is of course declining not rising due to mass immigration particularly in the 20th century the greatest irony being 
that European societies, the geographical and cultural origin of the idea of ethnically homogenous nation states is precisely one region of the world where that notion uh, barely exists anymore because of mass migrations. Um, so it's a paradoxical, ironic, and in many ways irrelevant you know, sort of concept. It's a political concept, but it's not a useful empirical uh, sort of concept, if you will. We can talk about the state and stateness and state capacity and whether or not states uh, are sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, holding up their basic obligations to fulfill, uh, you know, sort of, you know, again, basic services of security and welfare for their populations that would allow them to meet the test of even being considered states. And that's separate from the idea of the nation state. And there too, of course, as you well know, many states in the world, if not most states, don't actually even pass that test. Um, I've spent a lot of time writing about how when we talk about the state, what we often mean in the case of most states in the world is one city, the population of that city, and that city, the capital city or the commercial center effectively being the nucleus of an atom and a vast zone of more or less unproductive space surrounding it, or it could be a very small space. You know, the median population of a country in the world is if I'm not mistaken, somewhere 10 to 15 million people or something like that. Um, and of course, one city dom dominates that population, one city dominates the economy. So the idea of, again, the state, is some kind of robust empirical construct in a uniform way, is one of the worst mythologies that we, you know, inflict and impart and impose upon our students. And, uh, you know, I'm under no obligation to sustain that mythology when I devote a lot of my work to dismantling it. So, so again, do we still have states despite everything I just said? Absolutely. And do they, again, what is the one aspect of sovereignty? I'll reinforce this point because it's so incredibly important. The one thing that is left of the state, even if you no longer uh, characterize them by their degree of state capacity or their degree of ethnic homogeneity, um, is that most of them to a greater or lesser degree still attempt to control their borders because otherwise they would just be black holes. They wouldn't really be states. So the fact that they can control their borders, I mean, look at the government of Afghanistan, you know, even prior to its collapse, Ashraf Ghani's government stopped issuing passports to Afghan citizens, and the Taliban has declared that it will not allow Afghan citizens to be evacuated from the country. A perfect example of restrictive outward migration policy, right? And then, of course, many countries restrict who can come in. Look at what's happening with European countries and how they handle refugees coming across the Mediterranean on rafts. Uh, for those who don't know, they shoot at them. They shoot at them with guns, and they are culpable morally and otherwise for the deaths of thousands of African migrants who never make it across the Mediterranean Sea because they've effectively been murdered by European police and border forces or by the militias that Europeans pay off to keep them on shore in North Africa so they remain enslaved. America does similar things, but in fact, in truth, not even as bad as the Europeans on the Mexican border. So there is that capacity of the state um, but at the same time, we would not have arrived at the world we are at today with the nation state being so diluted, with mass migrations of the 20th century and into the present having created such a diverse, heterogeneous population in so many countries, if migration did not succeed, if migration, again, did not overwhelm the populism of Brexit, overwhelm the populism of Trump, and overwhelm the resistance of Western societies such as you know, Germany and others that absorb hundreds of thousands of migrants every single year. So again, the, this is an issue that has to be looked at from a long-term arc, not strictly from the perspective of, of short-term politics. Thank you. And there's one more question about climate change and, and predicting migration. So the question, if I could read it so that maybe you can help me understand this, how do you see the importance of fighting climate change vis-a-vis -vis the prediction of mass migration. Did the green movement get it wrong? 
Well, I mean, the green movement is no longer one, you know, sort of coherent movement. There are uh, elements or pillars of the green movement that are now supportive of nuclear power and geoengineering. Whereas, of course, in the origins of the green movement, it was very anti-nuclear uh, power to take just one issue in which there's an internal uh, schism. So, uh, you know, what I so I wouldn't really you know, put the locus of the actors that we're discussing simply on the green movement. But more, more importantly in the question is fighting climate change. So if we were to undertake radical geoengineering measures to reduce the atmospheric, you know, emissions of greenhouse gases, and, and uh, if we were to um, uh, block out, you know, sunlight to reduce the heat effect, if we were to do large scale carbon capture and storage and plant trillions of trees around the world and so forth, we still would not return to the climate that we had. There's no such thing. You can't turn back the clock in a complex adaptive system. In a complex system, you continuously have a new normal every single day. So we don't know what the exact new or next normal would be, even if we did everything perfectly right in terms of geoengineering without causing another disaster that we can't quite exactly foresee. But if we were to at least have some degree of higher stability and stable climate niche and restore agriculture, regenerative agricultural practices around the world and be able to reduce the rising temperatures and have some degree of climatic stability in much of the world where people live today, then you could imagine more people staying where they are versus the scenario of climate catastrophe However, you would not have eradicated the, all of the other causes of migration because you would still have an aging population of the North with labor shortages. You would still have a surplus underemployed population in the South. You would still have the civil wars and political crises. You would still have the economic disruptions and technological or economic dislocation and technological disruptions. And people would still move for all of the reasons that they have been moving prior to us talking about climate change, which of course in the 20th century was hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. So we don't need climate change to make the argument that there have been and will continue to be large scale migrations. Climate change simply accelerates and combines with uh, many of the factors that were already underway. Thank you. Um you haven't answered my question about forest migration and how that factors in into the ah. movement of, of people. Yeah, because as I said, uh, it's just, I'm just really, uh, you know, stunned by the numbers of growing forest migration right. uh, for various, uh, uh, driven by various causes. And one, as you can see in, in parts of, of the Middle East is really the right. fragility of states at the same time, even because of, climate change, right? You have displacement that's in Absolutely. the hundreds of thousands every year. Yeah. I think there's many forms of involuntary, you know, or forced migration and climate is of course one of them. And you rightly cited the fact that there are more climate migrants or refugees in the world today than there are political refugees. Some years they are neck and neck, which is equally bad news. But of course, uh, you know, the further we look into the future, the more likely it is that, um, you know, climate uh, crises will cause ever larger uh, refugee flows. But again, it does combine with the political factors, as we know from Sudan and from from Syria uh, and elsewhere. Again, these factors come together. So involuntary migration ranges everything from collapsed states and refugee waves from the Arab Spring in Syria and Afghanistan um, to, of course, modern day slavery, uh, which is also a significant okay. form of involuntary migration, which persists in a very acute form, very pernicious form uh, to this day. It's actually something that I talk about in multiple sections of the book when I look at either some of these geographies um, where you continue to have those cultural practices or where you have black markets, you know, for um, effectively bonded labor, indentured servitude or domestic indentured servitude uh, in the agriculture or other sectors um, and, and, and so forth. So there are many instances of this or, of course, you know, forced prostitution and these kinds of things. So all of those are various facets that fit under this category of involuntary migration. And we have larger numbers of that than we have had, you know, in, in a long time. Again, this is one of the areas where, you know, accurate data is difficult to find. Uh, but as you rightly indicated, it, it could be, uh, you know, millions of undocumented such migrants every single year across all of the many borders uh, of the world. And it is 
principally occurring within Asian geographies, just to be clear, or whether the countries of origin or destination tend to be predominantly Asian, whether it's West Asian in the Gulf countries or, or um, you know, Middle East, or whether it is actually here in our own region of Southeast Asia. Okay, um, we have just have a few more minutes left. I don't know whether there are any questions. I can't see it in the chat, but I wanted to ask uh, whether you've thought about COVID and, you know, this, this just, we have been told by the WHO that, you know, COVID may not be the, the last one and there are more, uh, more virulent viruses and different variants coming our way really with increased connectivity. And as a result of that, we've actually, you know, in the last two years, they say it's not sustainable, but the normal uh, responses of countries is actually to close borders to protect the population and see more of that happening. I mean, I wonder if you have factored that in your analysis. Oh, of course. I mean, COVID plays a very significant role. So again, in two ways, uh, both the restriction and the motivation. In terms of restriction, of course, it's my point of departure, because again, it is this T equals zero moment in my analysis, the fact that we can actually locate this point in time where migration stopped. And from this moment forward, we can actually measure where people have gone, as I said at the beginning, is a very important role of COVID or function of COVID, albeit you know, sort of uh, involuntarily from our part. But uh, I suppose just as important is that it will motivate people to shift from red zones to green zones, because people will be much more cognizant now of whether they live in a place with a good medical system, good medical care, the ability to take you know, care of them, or if there is a lockdown or a quarantine in the future, what kind of place do they want to be in for uh, indefinite prolonged period of time? So you can see, for example, I have a section of the book about um, investor migration, right? So high net worth individuals and their acquisition of alternative or secondary citizenships uh, through investment into, you know, particularly European uh, jurisdictions. And the companies that facilitate uh, that process have been opening offices in Nigeria, in India, uh, and uh, in, in China and elsewhere, right in the middle of the pandemic. Because you have people saying, wait, I want to not be in Nigeria, I don't want to be in India, or I don't want to be, you know, even though China doesn't have a high incidence of COVID, I want to be able to come and go as I please, or to simply go to Portugal or to Cyprus or to England or Canada for as long as I want, where I can roam freely. So there are many motivations that people have, and COVID has absolutely led to uh, a, a growth. It's been it's 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 turned that industry into a into a growth area. Uh, precisely because people are want to not be in a red zone country in the future. Okay, so um, if there are no questions, I guess this has been um, really, really a fascinating, fascinating discussion. And uh, I'm sure um, with this uh, preview, exclusive preview to your book, I'm, I suppose, we can now uh, have more people buying, and uh, you know, once it comes out. Did you say in October, in a September or October, in the bookstore? Yeah, yeah you can. Let us yeah, in Singapore and in the region, it will be early October. But feel free to to pre-order now if you like. Thank you, and uh, it leaves me now to um, uh, to bring this uh, webinar to a close. And to once again uh, express our thanks to Parag for uh, you know taking the time out to tell us more about the book and to engage us in a very fascinating dis uh, discussion about movements of people, and pointing us to something which we may not have imagined before, but is actually possible given the kind of scenarios that he has painted, and the kind of you know factors that would actually trigger more rather than reduce more movements of people. So thank you and thank you so good much. afternoon. Thank you.